Okay. Live on Facebook. Live on Facebook. Share on page and manage. Not that page. Go here. Next. I always forget to do this at the beginning. <laughs> and I'm always a few minutes late. <laughs> well, then everybody's ready at least. Yeah, yeah. Uh, title. Okay, so that's uh, preparing. Inspection. Part. And I always go back and edit this later. So, uh, live We're there. All right, I got 6.59. Should we go ahead and start, do you think? Yeah. Okay, let me pull up the screen here. One minute. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and go live and, uh, and we'll go. You ready? Yes, where? Okay, share screen. I'll, I'll share it with you just in just it'll yeah. probably be one minute. Yes, not yet. You tell me when I need to push the button. Okay. Well, good evening. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar this evening, Preparing Your Frisian for the Inspection Part 2, presented by Petra Zeeland and Duca Hoekstra. This webinar is being brought to you by the Finway Foundation for Frisian Horses. We also want to recognize Lisa Baker and the Education Committee for coordinating this webinar. We are recording the webinar and plan to have it posted on our library in the next few days. It should also be noted that we are broadcasting live on Facebook. As the viewer, you may experience some latency issues with the broadcast. Unfortunately, this is not something that we as the hosts can fix. This is due to each viewer's network configuration. We would suggest that if you are experiencing issues with latency, that you conduct a speed test or a latency test for future broadcasts. Tonight, everyone will be in listen only mode. We will stop periodically throughout the presentation to ask questions. To submit your question, you can use the Q&A at the bottom screen toolbar. If you are on Facebook, please write your question in the comments and we will try and get it answered for you. I would now like to introduce our speaker, Petra Zeeland. Petra, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Terrific. One second here and I'm going to stop my share and I'm going to turn it over to you, Petra. Okay. Share screen. Am I doing the right thing? Down across the bottom, it says the green button that says share screen. Yes, I did that. Yep. And then share again. There you go. This is the one. Okay. Okay. Well, I wanna welcome everybody again. Um, I had a lot of fun doing that webinar last time. So um, we had some videos last time and I understood that they were a little um, shaky 
coming through. So I decided to do uh, more pictures this time. And uh, whenever you have questions, please send them in through Facebook or Jason and he will ask the questions to me. Okay, so welcome. Um, today is gonna be about where we left last time, where I left you last time, that was the clipping of the horse. Um, due to my computer issues, uh, I wasn't able to show you the finished product. So that's something I would like to show you now. And um, that's the horse that we started with. So can I move your... Yes, oh, perfect. Um, this was the horse that we started with and after clipping, so this was three weeks before I did the clipping. And now I have to see if we, there you go. And this was after the total body clip. I just wanna point out that the difference between the leg quality is very visualized in this picture. So this was the finished product and I wasn't able to show it to you guys last time. So that's why I wanted to show it to you. Now, one thing that I wasn't able to show you last time as well was here, are the two pictures next to each other. And you can see it's a huge difference. Now, I wouldn't recommend, I told you last time, I wouldn't recommend the whole body clip before the curing because you can see the color difference. Um, but this is a sports clipping, a training clipping for in the winter over here when we keep showing and training them. Um, and it's easier to have them dry and keep their legs clean if they still go outside and have them uh, scratches free and um, that we're able to treat that better. Okay, the tail, that was what something I wasn't able to show you guys. Um, that's a question often asked when I'm in the US, what should the length of the tail be? Um, I know that in Northern America, and in a lot of show rings over there, people like to have as a long as possible tail. Sometimes they show up at the curring like that with the tail dragging on the floor. Um, our judges don't specifically like that better. Um, it's a typical Northern American uh, thing, I guess, to have them like that. We don't have the tails like that. And especially for the curring, it doesn't, um, confirmation wise, it doesn't add anything. So this is a little video about what I do to get the right length for the tail for the curring. I have to find my, um, to start, I have a rolled up towel underneath the tail. Usually I ask somebody to put their hand on arm underneath the tail. The reason for this is that when a horse moves, it usually lifts the tail a little bit. Um, so I want to cut the tail um, in a way that the horse would carry it when it's moving. So when you're in dressage and you have a nice blunt cut tail and you have nothing underneath the tail and you cut it then and the horse starts walking and trotting and it lifts the tail. Sometimes when you look around, you notice that people cut their tail crooked, like it's cut like that, that way from the hind to the front um, in an angle, but they didn't cut it in an angle. It was hanging straight down and that's the reason why um, it looks like it's cut in an angle. Now, this is the length. Oh, I have to go back. This is the length that we have it for the curring. It's a little bit jumpy, the video. So what you see 
I hope you can see it. I cut the tail and it's halfway the fat locks. I just paused the image so everybody can see it. What you notice when you do that, and when you leave it this long, can you see that my uh, thing moving around in the screen, Jason? My cursor? Yes. Okay. Yep, we gotcha. Okay. So that's the bottom of the tail right now. What you notice is that this part of the tail is very thin. You can see right through it. Now for the curring, this is fine. And this is a pretty long tail. So it's halfway the fat block, as you can see. Now for the curring, this is a perfect length. Um, later on, now from the back, it's the same again. You can see how sheer the tail is. I move the horse around so you can see the tail waving around. There you go. So this is a nice length for the curring. Now I put the rolled up towel underneath it again. I'm gonna brush through that tail again, make sure that all the hairs are straight down before I cut it. And there you go. Now this probably comes as a shock to a lot of you guys because I'm gonna cut off a lot. Now, I know I'm at some, sometimes I come at barns and they ask me, please cut the tail the length you would cut it when you're at home. Now you can see how much I take off that tail. And usually I show them, well, this is what I would take off. And then people turn white and they kind of panic and they say, and I tell them, well, okay, I can see that you don't like me to cut this off, but this is usually what I take off when I have my horses in training and um, show them in dressage and, um, all that stuff. For the curing, I usually grow it a little longer. So that is the result of that cut tail. And you can see how nice and full that tail looks right, right now. Um, the reason I prefer to keep them just a little bit shorter than the curing length is because they only go to the curing once and a year and when they go to the central mare curing that's the second time and then you can have enough time to grow it out but when you have them in your stall and you have those long tails usually what happens is they step on them when they lay down or try to get up or it gets stuck in the straw and um, and there's what I, uh, and then they, it gets thinner and thinner and they lose the thickness in their tail. And this is where I show you how high up I cut the tail. And this is the finished product of that tail. You can see over here, this is a cut I like to look at. Um, I know it's a little bit uh, anxious for, American people, when you cut it like this, but we are used to it. So um, when you, especially in the in Northern America in the winter, they go outside in the snow and it's a little bit muddy. When you cut them a little bit shorter, you maintain more thickness for uh, the coming up summer season. If you leave them longer and longer and they roll and they play in the mud and they um, get up and they step on their tail. That's when you use, when you lose a lot of length and thickness from that tail. So usually we cut them, if you keep them out in the field, we cut them, a, even then we cut them a lot shorter. And then for the summer, it's all grown back for the curring if you want to go to the curring. So that was my little thing that I did, wasn't able to do last time about cutting the tail. 
For me, it's important that you roll up or have an arm underneath the tail to make sure that you cut it right. Because you can see when you have a blunt cut like this, um, it needs to be straight. Okay, next. We're gonna go to the hooves. Now, that's important for the curing as well. First things first, I wanna tell you, I'm not a farrier and I'm, or a veterinarian. I can only speak from the experience I have had in the past and I'm still going through with farriers. Um, I have a little video here. This is how we prepare for the curing. You have your farrier over. Then what we do is we ask the farrier to look at our horse and listen to our horse. Now, this is Peter Ackerma from the Noosterhoeve. He is a farrier. He's also a breeder and an owner of an approved stallion. He has his own stable, training stable. He's a driver and um, horse trader. And I asked him to help me out for this video. He's checking the horse right now on soundness. The way the horse moves his legs and the way the horse puts his feet on the front on the floor when it walks. The same thing we do in the trot. Oh, it's good for you guys if you can hear. So he listens and he looks at the way the, the horse puts his feet on the ground and moves his legs around and Told me here that if you listen really carefully, you can hear one leg is a little bit different in sound than the other one. Now that can have a lot of reasons. When I train the horse, I know it doesn't bend as well to one side as the other side. So that is usually a reason as well why a horse isn't. Um, uh, given the same sound on each foot, but you have to listen really well to do, um, to figure that out. And a farrier usually is trained on that. So um, then something I run into when I go to North America is um, that a lot of the times a Frisian is still looked at as a draft horse and people get farriers that are very good at um, doing um, draft horses. Now, doing shoeing for a draft horse is completely different than for a Frisian. For a draft horse, you want to have the big, floppy foot so you have the 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 high up knee action and um, they actually pull up the hoof more underneath the body and they don't lengthen the stride as much as the frisian so this is something i want to show you guys that i run into and it also comes with a question i often get when i'm there so the top foot is a normal foot, the way it normally should look like, kind of. Now, when you grow out the hoof, so after a couple of weeks, you get your farrier again. When you grow out, it lengthens. This would be a normal way to have a hoof lengthen. Now, something I want to add to that as well is that in Northern, Northern America, it's very normal and common to buff and grind and scrape and um, make the hoof as shiny and smooth as possible. Uh, that looks really pretty. And that's something what I like to do every now and then. But a disadvantage of that is 
that you keep on filing and uh, shaving off the wall of the hoof. What happens is that wall gets thinner and thinner. Now a frisian is getting more and more expressive in its movement. So what we run into is that because of the filing and the smoothing, the wall gets thinner and is less able to carry the weight in that movement of the horse. So in the back, where a lot of pressure is in the movement, is that this starts to um, break off and gets thinner and it starts curling to the inside or outside and it breaks off. So that's why I pointed out this part. Now what I see happen is that the farrier thinks, okay, well, we need hoof. So I leave the front on there, but I'm gonna cut away the weaker part. Now, when I go on uh, Google and I look at draft horse feet, this is kind of how draft horses feet end up looking like too. Um, but with the movement of the Frisian and the powerful movement, it's important that you don't file off that much of that outside wall because they need it to, um, they need it to be able to uh, go um, uh, work with the pressure or that big movement they have. So they need a strong wall. Now I go to the next one. So this is where the farrier cut off that part. Now, doesn't look like a lot is wrong with this hoof. Not, well, you see that the weight is not distributed uh, good anymore. Usually this goes more backwards because the weight ends up being more that there. Now, for the next picture, see the difference. Now this, the front becomes too floppy. Now what happens a lot of the time is then, okay, well, let's file off more of the front. Now it looks kind of like a normal foot again. For a reason, it's important that this doesn't happen. Now there's another question. When this happens, nothing looks wrong with the foot, but something else happens. Now it doesn't look wrong, but it's not positive for the balance. This part on the hoof often turns white. What happens is the wall is filed off so much that the white line, so the hoof without any color that's underneath the wall shows up. And people ask me, why is the hoof of my Frisian turning white? So slowly I started putting those things together because I'm not a farrier. This is just experience. Uh, and I found out that this was the way to put the, the hoof back in the shape it was before. Now, the reason it ends up like this is but because of the buffing and the shaving and the sandpaper and all the um, smoothing out of the hoof. Now, if you do that, Constantly, the wall gets thinner and thinner and thinner, and this part gets weaker. So you end up with that part breaking off. Then you end up with a hoof like this. Then you want to have that flappy part off. You end up like this. Then you end up like this. And you see, this was the hoof we started with. This is the foot we end up with. And when you put them side by side, barely anything looks wrong. Actually, it looks pretty nice. The only thing that you notice is that the front of your foot turns white. And maybe that the movement of your Frisian is not that balanced anymore and even gets a little bit of a higher rhythm. Another side effect of this is also that when you ride your Frisian in dressage is that it's harder for the horse to canter. 
Imagine standing on a flat surface and putting shims underneath the front of your foot and try to walk or run that way. That's how this feels like for a horse, I imagine. So very important to look for that. Now I'm not a farrier, I'm not a veterinarian, but this is something we ran into a couple of times. And when you lo start looking around, looking at feet that aren't painted for show yet, this is something I noticed a lot, especially when you start looking for it. It's something I see. And then uh, the rhythm in the trot goes up because of this. Um, and then um, it's harder to get that trot that you want to show off for the judges in the end at the curring. So um, this is something that I really wanted to point out that I noticed and that uh, at some places we changed it and it was really an improvement for, uh, for instance, dressage and uh, extending a trot for the Frisian under saddle and in hand. So that's a good thing to know. This is just something that you can uh, talk to about with your farrier, if that is a possibility. Okay, any questions so, about- Yeah, so I've got, a, I've got a question here. It says, uh, uh, many horses I've seen pictures of in Holland have very steep upright angles and a lot of heel. Uh, any pros and cons to that? Yes, that's coming up. Okay, okay. Okay, now this is also an example of a hoof that is kind of happening the same thing to. Uh, the difference is, is that this farrier didn't file off the front, he just rounded it off. But you can see that the, I have to name it, the frog, is, is it the frog? I think it's the, no, it's not the frog, it's the bulb of the heel. This back side. Yeah, well, you can see it's leaning backwards. It means that there's a lot of pressure on this foot. Um, the weight on it is a lot. So this is not a right angle either. Um, this is just an example of how it should not be. So this is higher up. This is what we would like to see but not in this angle. Now, same here. This is not what you wanna go to with to the curring with this foot. As you can see, the white line is coming through. Um, the inside is completely off. The outside, yes, yeah, kind of nice. Um, this top, I left this. I wanted to show you this because sometimes I see people in panic asking, my Frisian has a lot of crusts and parts in his um, coronary band, I believe this is called. Um, what it is, is that a Frisian grows more hair here. So the transition uh, from the hair to the hoof, because the hoof is made out of hair, um, is messier than a warm blood. What we do is we just shave it off. As you can see, when you don't shave it off, it curls up and it you get that messy look. So this is a picture of a shoe or a hoof you don't want to go to the curing with. Now, for the shoes, there are rules. The KFPS, has a maximum width of 25 millimeters. Now I try to figure out what the right measurement of that is to translate in inches. I think it's almost an inch, but not quite. So 25 millimeters is the width they allow you to go to the curing. Um, I just put a new shoe and an older shoe next to each other just for the 
views. Now, this shoe has more of an ideal shape. On this shoe, you can see that the hoof is more narrow and that is something you uh, do not prefer for your Frisian. You would like to have that nice round shape of a hoof. Now, the width, the thickness of the shoe. Now, the thickness of the KFPS, uh, they say of the shoe has to be eight millimeter. Now, I couldn't find a measurement for that. I think it's one third of an inch or something, maybe. Um, eight millimeter is the max for the curing. Now, what I usually do is I put on 10 millimeter shoes. They do wear down when you're training and due to that we practice on the streets on the pavement or on the asphalt is that they wear down and by the time you go to the curing you end up with eight millimeter shoes so it shouldn't be a problem to put 10 millimeter on as long as they wear down and they're eight millimeters this is just practical um, we practice a lot on the road. For instance, sometimes you put them in harness and you go driving and you go drive through a village and you're on the road a lot. So they wear down a lot. Now, I know that in Northern America, a lot of the times the shoes are already eight millimeter. So when uh, I know that because when horses come in from the Netherlands, what they do sometimes is they put 10 millimeters on just before they leave. So they can reuse those shoes as an example on how they were shoed before. So they are not worn down that much. So they can see how uh, the horses were shoed before they, were, before they left. So this is just something practical. If you know you're on the road a lot, practicing in hand or riding or driving on the road uh, as part of your training for the curing, we just put 10 millimeters on and because they wear off, you end up with eight millimeters before you go to the curing. Same and, is for when you bring them to an ABFP test or whatever. Now, if you're not on the road that much, then um, you probably should put eight millimeter underneath their hooves. Quick, quick question for you there, Petra. Is, yes. Um, when the judges measure the horses, they will take that uh, the shoe into consideration when they're measuring. Is that correct? Yes, correct. Okay, and they'll 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 subtract that eight millimeters off of the height. Yeah, kind of. Yes. Okay. Now this is one I put in there just because they look really good. Um, this is where you see the higher heel, uh, but you can also see that the hoof is of a very nice quality. Uh, this wall is, as you can see, you can still see the rasping of the farrier in there. Um, this, has, this horse has a very good quality, so he didn't have to do a lot to make them smooth like this. Now, this horse, as you can see, I clipped this all the way up. Now, this is something I didn't show on the uh, last webinar because that horse I didn't take off the hairs of the hooves and the reason for that I'll show you in a little bit. Um, this part again this is when you don't maintain it when you don't maintain it it starts getting flaky and it looks messy and um, if you never had a Frisian before uh, and you have long hair growing over it, you just have to make sure that you um, brush with a hard brush and make sure that it comes off. And when you when the hooves are wet and you have a really hard brush, you can just uh, rub it really hard and it gets nice and clean. And when it's soft, it just falls off and it's not a problem. And when your farrier comes, you can always ask to file it a little bit more and then it ends up smoothing. Uh, being even to the hoof but as soon as that starts growing out it's the same again um, but when you like the longer hair on the hooves so these this is the same horse then you have to deal with more um, 
scabs, it's not scabs, but flakes. And um, if, you, if you ask your farrier to watch out for the hairs, because if he starts um, scraping away on this, usually they take a lot of hair with it as well. So if you don't want that, then you have to find a way to pull up the hairs and have a sock or some tape around it so he can clean that up nicely. Now, this is a standard hoof for the hind of the horse, for the, the, for the hind hooves. Um, I put this one in because I just looked like a really nice um, example of how it would look like if not all the hair is on top of that hoof. As you can see, it has a higher heel and um, that just goes with a more modern Frisian at the moment. So that's why that um, gets more and more in there. This is one as well. This is a very nice looking one as well. As you can see a little bit more heel and just nice and straight. And now this horse I picked out and um, for the hooves and as you can see, I didn't clip the hairs of the coronary band, and we're going to show you why. Let's see if I can pause it a little further. There. As you can see, this horse has a little bit of a bend in it. And it's nice and straight on the inside. Now, the judges like to see nice straight hooves. So this would be a reason why I wouldn't cut off the hair. Now, if, he has, if she has really nice feet and the hair is way too long and um, I show her a lot in sports, then... Uh, I would cut it, but because I know this horse has to go to occurring, um, I just leave it on because you don't want to, if they have little flaws, you don't want to show off the flaws. That's just reality. So that's the reason why I didn't take off this hair. So it's nice and straight here, but you can see there's a little bit of a bend here. And you know that can happen when, you're, when they're out in the field. They usually are out in the field all summer over here in the Netherlands uh, with a foal. Uh, they only come in um, for the farrier or to get inseminated again for the next pregnancy. So all those weeks they wear and tear their hooves the way they want to walk and trot. Um, and then sometimes difference in pressure um, is there because they prefer to move this way or that way. And you usually figure out when you start training if they prefer to bend to the left or the right. And this all has to do with the balance of the horse and the way they carry themselves. If they put a little bit more pressure on the outside of the wall of the hoof, then uh, this happens. And if they don't put any pressure on the inside, it stays nice and straight. So this is just practical things that happen. Um, I will play the video more. And what you see as well is that the difference between no hair and hair, uh, the hoof looks a lot bigger when there's less hair in front of the hoof. Now judges like to see big hooves, so you could thin out the hair a little bit just to show off that your horse has big hooves. Okay, find my play. Now the other one, you can see this one. So these are just little details. Um, you can see on this one, this one is actually nice and straight. So if both hooves were like this, I would cut it but now I don't. And as you can see, again here, he scraped off the residue or the flaking of the mixture of, that's actually where the, the hoof and hair separates kind of. Okay. So that was it. Now in the front, you can see that we have a little bit of a lift in the shoe. Now for a horse that has 
um, nice uh, spacious movement. This is just makes it more smooth. Um, just imagine you walking on um, a little flat piece of wood, try to run on it. It's harder than when you have that piece of wood follow the shape of your foot and it's rounder and it's easier to walk and run that way. It's just little practical things like that that make you do little uh, um, adjustments to a shoe. It's also um, really practical for the canter. It really improves the, imp the, the, the possibility or the, the capacity of carrying the horse itself in the canter. Now, this is a piece that came off that hoof. I wanted to show this because this shows that um, we want to have a little bit of lift in the back. Now that lift only stays there if you cut less from the hind than the front. It's just teeny weeny little bit of difference, but because it's uh, because of the movement and the weight um, uh, that this already uh, wears off on the shoe as well. So try to prevent to cut off the same length front and back. Just leave a little bit on, on the back when you're cutting it, up, cutting it off and then you can always file it. So this is a question I asked my farrier. So know that he said that is the reason because I, if I keep cutting, the same way I'll end up with a long-toed Frisian that is less in movement. Okay, so that's Good why- question I'm... for you, Petra. Yes. yes. Uh, does it have to be that specific type of shoe for the curing? Um, no, because you have different uh, factories that make shoes and you can have a farrier that makes its own shoes as long as it's um, with one or two toe clips um, or no toe clips. So okay. that's basic. It's not allowed to be wider. It's not allowed to be heavier. It's not allowed to be thicker. It is allowed to be thinner. Um, yeah, and then uh, what we have, what we add sometimes is we add uh, holes in the shoes to screw, um, um, try to remember the name. I just call them pins. I don't know the, the English word right now. Uh, we put studs, studs in them studs. because mm -hmm. we show on grass every now and then, especially when you're on the horse. I like to have studs because we have clay surface and on clay, a horse will always slip and slide even without shoes. When they're naturally or barefooted, they will slide. So that's when we put um, uh, studs in. Now, when they're really well balanced and you show on grass in hand, you don't need studs. So a lot of the times for the curing, horses don't need studs over here. Now in Northern America, the soil is a lot different. So when I walk in the pastures over there, it's much more sandy, the places I've been to. So you don't need any studs there either when you show on grass. We even do the stallion shows on grass over there. And at fir the first time I was like, oh my God, we need studs because it's gonna slide, but then I, rode on the grass and I was fine with it because we're so used to slipping and sliding over here when we don't have those things in the shoes. But a, a good another, balance, yes. Another question for you. Yes. Is my farrier does not like the front clip. He only uses shoes with the side clips. How much does the side clip differ in hoof health, hoof health and movement? The hoof, when you put pressure on a hoof, a hoof widens. So when you use 
two toe clips, then there's less uh, there's uh, less space room for the hoof to extend, extract, and retract. Is that how you call it? Um, to make this movement. So when it puts it down, it goes like that and it comes up again. And when you put two toe clips on it, on front and back, then it's less able to make that movement. But it all depends on how the shoe is on the foot. I know stables who have two toe clips on all four feet, but um, they use a different shape of shoe in the front. And that's very important. If you put the same shape of shoe from the hind foot on the front foot, you can imagine um, how that feels for a horse. It feels like you putting on a shoe that is like half a size too small. So it will pinch. It's important that the shape of that shoe fits the front hoof. I've seen farriers that was in Europe over here that they put the two clipped shoes from the hind foot. So made for the, for the hind foot, put them on the front foot. Those horses started making shorter movements, shorter strides. And when you rode them, it felt like you would walk and trot on coals, hot coals. So that is important. Um, as long as they have the right shape, it shouldn't be a big problem. We don't like to put two clipped shoes on front feet just because of that. The, the biggest movement in the front feet is just the whole width. So we like to, and to, when the shoe comes off the hoof, you can see it where the shoe and the hoof come together. There's always um, rubbing of the hoof on the shoe. And that's how you can see that there's a mechanism in the hoof that goes in and out, in and out each step the horse makes it goes in and out. So that's very important that, that if he does two clips in the front, that it fits the shape of the hoof. Then it's less of an issue. It's very important that it doesn't have the shape of the hind feet because those shapes are totally different. I hope that answers the question. How about uh, brighter aluminum shoes? Are they frowned upon? Depends on what horse. My own sports horse love the alum aluminum shoes. Um, the lighter the shoes, the better he got. Um, <clears throat> but that completely depends on your horse. <clears throat> we even had show horses that preferred um, acrylic hooves, uh, shoes. Um, the movement was way better. And some horses just love heavier uh, don't love get improve their movement by heavier shoes it you just have to try it and see what happens um judges don't care if they're aluminum okay i will go to the next one now <clears throat> again this is something I wanted to show you. It's again about the buffing and the scraping um, and the clipping of the hair to clip or not to clip. This is how it looks without. And you can see the difference in size of the hoof. Optical, it is an illusion of course, because the size is still the same. You just make it look like it's bigger. Now, what I wanted to show on this shoe hoof as well is you can see those ridges in here. And right here. Now, this is probably um, late spring, 
or something, or maybe in the summer that she changed from pasture to stable, I don't know. But if you would start buffing and filing away to get this even, you can see there's depth in this ridge. Now, if I would buff until it's completely smooth, imagine how much wall I had to take off and how much strength I would take off that hoof. Now, if you do that here, where a lot of the pressure is, when a horse moves and extends the trot or canters, then um, you can imagine how quickly a Frisian would uh, just crush through the wall. And then you end up again with a long-toed, low-heeled uh, hoof. So that's something you want to prevent. Um, I would like to buff this one a little bit more when I would go to a show, but that's just a little bit to get the, these little creases out. But when I spray paint it black or when I put black paint on it, you can barely see the grooves in it anyway. So it's not that important. More important is that the hoof stays strong uh, so you can maintain the right shape. And the hind foot, um, same here, just showing the difference in what happens if you take it off or when you leave the hair on. Okay. Now this is, I wanna thank uh, Peter Okama because he helped me with uh, this part of the hooves. This is just basic, uh, knowledge uh, that you should know when you go to occurring. You would like to keep the shape uh, nice and round, um, uh, the walls nice and straight. As you could see, the horse I showed you has a little bit of a bend in it, but that's due to that he was in the pasture uh, for months with the foal, and at night he was it, she was in the stable, but during the day outside, and now she's inside. Um, and just comes out in the paddock as in, and is in the stall and is being trained each day. So the buildup of the hoof is a little bit different. Um, so that's why I leave the hairs on. Um, a little bit of a higher heel is what they prefer just because we noticed that the build and the exterior and the leg shape of the Frisians changes a little bit. So we have to keep up with the hooves as well. Um, Keep in mind, the more you file and buff, the thinner the wall becomes and the weaker the wall is to carry your Frisian. Um, and uh, that makes the hoof break. So that's very important uh, to remember as well. Just try and talk to your farrier. Um, what you could do is just look up pictures um, even go to uh, YouTube, maybe find a video on uh, Dutch shoeing on um, Frisians. Maybe there is one. This is just some basic knowledge I wanted to share that I know um, of what we look at uh, when we go to occurring with a Frisian. Um, so any questions about that? I've got, uh, got a couple of questions here. If I leave my horse barefoot, do their chances of making star diminish? Not if it doesn't um, prevent her from showing her maximum movement. But I know from experience that if you show them barefoot, the movement is not as spectacular as a little shoe underneath the horse. Now, a one-year-old is not allowed to be shown with shoes. A two-year-old is allowed to show with shoes and, of course, up. But a one-year-old is not allowed to be shown with shoes, just to make sure that you guys know that. That's important to know. Anything else? And it wasn't not too long ago, stallions were required to be presented barefoot. Do you know why this changed? Um, I don't know the real reason, 
but what I got from it is that it didn't uh, add or took away anything to just keep the shoes on because you know what we did? We went to the stallion show um, to show the stallions. And what we did, we brought our farrier with us and just an hour before they had to go into the arena to be judged, we took the shoes off. And as soon as they came out of the arena and we knew that they made it to the next selection, the farrier put the shoes back on. And um, I think that the, the stud book and the judges looked at it again and said, well, as long as everybody uses the same shoes, the same width and the same thickness, then it shouldn't matter if we uh, judge them with or without shoes. And actually nothing changed. So the, it, it, it just enhances the movement a little bit more when they have shoes. More questions about this? Uh, yes, I have a um, from, uh, from Jenny here. It says, uh, my 10 year old Frisian has a side bone which sometimes makes him very slightly lame. He doesn't have shoes on. Is there anything I can do with his hoof that will help him? I do not know the answer on That's, that. Uh, okay, might be, might be something for her to ask her vet, wouldn't you think? Yes, her, ask yeah. her vet or maybe even find um, a side hoof. I just tried to figure out what a side hoof is. I imagine that that is a little bit of extra bone growing inside of the hoof. I know what the Dutch word is for what I mean, but I don't know if that is exactly <laughs> what it means. And it just makes them a little bit more sensitive. So maybe padding would help or um, I do, I'm not sure if you're allowed to show your horse with padding, but I think if you just I, I think it shouldn't be a problem, especially with older horses. If you have like a little padding or, or um, uh, they spray something in between just to make it more soft for the horse. But I'm not sure about that. So any other questions about the hooves? Uh, no, no, not at the moment. That's, uh, I should cover that subject. Okay, then I'll go to the next subject. What I wanna do is, um, I want to show everybody the tech that I use for current preparation, um, just so that for the next webinar, people are get, getting the chance to get their stuff together and um, maybe start training or fitting the stuff and have maybe have questions for the next time. Um, so the, I'm going to show you the things I use and how I put that on my horse and where I use it for. It's not that impressive, but I just wanna share it so everybody knows um, what to use or uh, what I use for that. So I stalled it out. This is my basics, what I use for lunging. Um, hind leg, fetlock protection, the reason I use that is um, you don't want any damages to show up on the legs before you go to occurring because a judge will notice if it's on a certain spot, like if the horse uh, hits his hind legs like that, or if your horse never had shoes on before and it uh, hits the hind leg like that, it can give a little uh, wound or a little scar or uh, something like that. So I like to use these in training uh, because I'm gonna uh, train the horse on poles and everything like that too. And, then, and if the horse spooks and the shoe hits something on the leg, then this is a nice thing to have for protection. Uh, front legs, tendon and fetlock protection as well. Uh, same thing. Um, 
it's nice to have a little bit of protection. And if you ask a little bit extra, you don't want the hind leg or the shoe to hit the tendon and uh, get damaged over there because the goal is to get an active hind leg and you don't want to have that hind leg uh, cut the front leg. This is a piece of harness, a surf single that I use. I just put different pictures of the same one on there so you can see how flexible it is. I like the flexible kind, uh, multiple rings. Uh, I like the one with a loose girth. So I can always, so I'm always sure that the rope or the side reins or the reins I use are in the center of the horse. So right in between the front legs. If you use a girth that goes all the way through and you have buckles on one side, the chance is that that ring that you use slides to one side. And what happened to me once is, that's why I like this girth. What happened to me once is that that little ring that I used uh, to do tie the rope on, um, shifted because the horse was a smaller horse and I have to tie it more uh, and it ended up behind one of the front legs and it started rubbing and rubbing and rubbing and it got completely raw um, and that hurts it stings especially when the horse sweats so the the, the um, behavior of the horse changed and I thought what's wrong and then I figured out that the rope completely rubbed off all the hair and made the elbow and the inside of the front leg raw. And that's something you want to prevent because if that happens right before the curring, the horse can even get lame because of it. So what, what I try to do in the webinar is just share fact, facts and uh, things that happened to me. Um, I don't want to make it more, um, how you can, more perfect than training a horse is it's these are just all facts and practical things that can happen um, it's nice and flexible uh, it fits every horse that's why i love this uh, it has little padding now i like this padding because it frees the withers a little bit so it doesn't pull down on the withers the withers is um, exactly a place that you want your horse to lift when you train them and if you have a girth or a sur single that puts pressure on there when it lifts when it moves it can get a sore spot and also um, that can make your horse lame or sensitive for a saddle or uh, a saddle pad or things like that and it can turn the withers of your frisian white because of the rubbing and the pressure it gives. Now I use an old padded uh, saddle pad to put underneath. I have a rope, it's fairly thick. I put a picture on here with my hand so you can see how thick that rope is. And it's very fine woven so it doesn't rub easy. Um, it's, a, it's about 20, 21 feet, 22 feet. Um, that's what I basically use to launch the horse. This is the bridle. It's a very old bridle. I made something myself. I cut an old halter in pieces. I put that on top of my bridle. So I have a couple of rings on the side. Um, in the next webinar or the webinar after that, you probably see me use this. Uh, what happens is when I put the rope through here and then to the bit, this applies pressure on the pole, um, you want to do that slowly and then it makes the Frisian drop the pole a little bit more and lengthen the neck instead of curling it up and making it short and push the back down. But that comes up in the next webinars. Uh, my lunge line, this is one I like because it has a rope on the end, the same soft rope. Um, I like this because it goes through the bit to the girth. That's something I will show you in the next webinar as well, the way I use this. Um, you, you can uh, use a double one of this, uh, then they turn in long lining. Uh, long lines, you have two clips and two ropes on the end, and then you uh, do, uh, it's called double lunging, 
uh, and that's an option as well. The whip, it's about seven feet, almost seven feet. And um, the lash is at least that long. Sometimes I replace the cracker with a leather lace of three feet, about three feet. It lengthens it a little bit more. Uh, that's more for the young horses when I use a bigger circle to lunge them in so I can still tap them on the right spot. Um, a fun thing that I have my interns do with this whip is that I put plastic cups on the um, wall of my inside arena and they had to practice on the cups to uh, flick a cup off the wooden beam because when you use the whip and when you train horses and especially young horses you need to be able to touch the right spot even if the horse is about 15 feet away from you so if you want to activate the hind leg you need to be able to flick the crack cracker just on the hind leg. If you want to have the horse bend more, you need to be able to touch the inside of the rump of the horse to make it understand that it needs to go out with the body instead of in, leaning in. So it's very important that you practice that as well. Or I had a rope with little ribbons on them and they had to flick the ribbons off the rope or just at least touch them each time just to make sure that they understood how important it was to know where to touch the horse when you launch the horse especially the young ones it's a jumping standard i use at least four of them i want to show you this because not all of us have a perfect uh lunging area uh, or a lunging circle. Um, I usually like to set out four of the poles and I use caution tape to um, set, cut off the, a, a corner of my inside arena, for instance. Outside I had a, a lunging arena, but inside I had my, just my inside riding, riding arena and I put these poles in and I used caution tape. And it's perfect because if a horse jumps through it or spooks, it breaks, you just tie it back together and you go on with your training. It also teaches them boundaries. Um, it also teaches them that um, they need to stay off the caution tape. They can get close, it doesn't hurt them. It's not uh, electrical, it's not electrical wire. It teaches them at the curring to not run through the rope that you use to put your triangle. Um, so it teaches them different things already just by lunging them in it. It helps them understand to follow the rope. And it helps uh, you as a trainer not to be dragged through a whole arena, of course. Now, these are jumping poles. They are about 10 feet. Um, they're about 10 centimeters. I think it's about three and a half inches thick. So not that heavy, easy to handle. And I use these um, for preparing for the curing as well. Uh, I put them on the ground. I put them around the circle, in the circle. I use them as uh, ground poles for them to trot over, to step over. Um, and it makes them less skittish of things that can show up or are there in the arena uh, for the curing. Um, different colors, uh, it helps for that as well. Now, <clears throat> when you're a little bit further in the training, this is something we use as well. Boots way, way made heavier with lead in them. It's the front boot and the back boot. Um, it's something uh, I want to show you guys because this is what we use. And I think there shouldn't be any secrets about it. Every training stable has them in their closet and they do use them. They use them for, um, well, like when you go to the gym and you want to get stronger, 
uh, you use some weights around your um, wrists or around your ankles, or you uh, use weights to get your arms stronger. Now, this is what we use to make the muscles in the front legs stronger for extension or lifting the hind leg, put a little weight on there as well. Um, so this is not a secret. This is something we just use to strengthen your horse a little bit more. Um, when they're older and they are higher, they go higher in dressage, um, I usually slowly build up this as well while riding, not every time. Um, sometimes when I started use, uh, uh, work on collection, I, for instance, put the hind ones on and then slowly work up to do the front ones and then all together. I never just put them on and train and train and train and train. You just use them and see if your horse responds on it. And if it doesn't respond at all, it doesn't improve. You never have to use them again on that horse. Every horse um, responds differently, reacts different on this training. We have bell boots uh, with weight in them as well, just for that extra uh, stretching, lengthening of the front leg. Um, it helps as well. So that's something that we use too. He, these are the ankle weights. I talked, some people use these, they're easy to put on and it gives them a little weight um, to get stronger as well. Um, you slowly build up, you can use them over the poles and the other weights <clears throat> as well. You can use them over the poles. It just helps to strengthen them a little bit more each time. Um, <clears throat> back to the sur single. This is how I use the saddle pad. Oh, wait, first. Any questions about the weights or the boots I use? Nope, I don't have any questions over any of this information yet. I've got one more question regarding uh, uh, shoeing, but uh, yes. I think we'll wait till, till the end, until you're, okay. until you're done, okay? okay. Yes. Um, the way I use the padded saddle pad, I just fold it just to make sure I do everything to prevent uh, that there is any chance for the horse to get white hair. Um, even a blanket is important that can put pressure on there that causes white hair. So I just try to prevent uh, the white hairs on the withers. Again, up here, I'll just show you how flexible that um, Sir Single is. Um, the thing I like about this sur single that a lot of sur singles don't have are these <coughs> eyes up here. It's for driving. Um, the way this came about is about 25 years ago. And I think maybe it's even started at the Friesian Horse Center. I was working there at the KFPS where the ABFP things uh, ABFP tests and the, the stallion testing was done. Um, what they did over there is they asked a tag store to take the sur single of a driving harness and um, make, it, make it into this what I have right here. The reason is because these are easy to use to shorten and to length the rope. Um, plus the sur single of a Frisian harness is very flexible and fits every horse. We had warm bloods, Frisian drafts, harness horses, and they fit all the horses. We had um, sur singles with a pre-shaped back piece. Pre-shape means that there was a piece of metal in it. And the wider the horse got, the more pressure on the rib cage down here came. And that makes the horse less easy to bend. Because imagine you putting a belt around your rib cage with a piece of wood or a piece of steel in it and then tighten it. That's not comfortable. So that is how this came about, a flexible um, sur single 
copied from an old Frisian harness that is quite flexible and then turned into a lunging uh, training um, tag. So that's how this came about. A little ring for a tail. Um, couleron, I think you believe, call it in English a couleron as well. Uh, I don't use it on this horse. I don't think she needs it. So I didn't put it on. This is how it's on the back. This is how I put that rope on. I have in the center of the rope a knot, so I know where the center of that rope is. And I'm sure that both sides have the same length. This, because I want to bend and stretch my horse later on. And if this, if you don't know where the center is, you don't know if you have um, your ropes, your side, your um, draw reins, or however you want to call these um, on your horse. It's important that they have the same length on both sides. Then you can shift over the knot a little bit to the left or the right, or when you want to shorten one side, you just swap it around this eye. Um, plus these are easy when you want to do double lunging or long lining. Um, so it's multifunctional. <clears throat> Something I want to point out, you can see this is a very old bridle and I replace some parts because I just love this nose band. The reason is because this leather strap is stitched and there's a hole through the nose band. And the reason why I like this is because when I put it on young horses and I'm slowly transitioning from a halter over the bridle to prevent pulling on the bit, what I do is I put the rope through the bit and through the nose band. So still, I'm not pulling on that bit, but there's a little bit more pressure. The horse feels that something is going on. And with this going through the nose band, it just makes sure that it doesn't snap when a horse spooks or wants to run away. So that's why I love this one. And it's very, I think it's about 20 years old now. And it's hard to find the new ones. I haven't seen them yet. I think someone in Denmark is making them now, but in the Netherlands, Netherlands I can't find them. It just helps um, a young horse not to be pulled in the bit all the time. So my lunge line just goes through the whole nose band and then through the bit. Just something I wanted to show you guys. This is the way I usually use the ropes. Again, the knot in the center goes down to the bit, down to the center, and then I use a knot. Now you can do it the other way around. You can make in the middle of the rope a little loop. You can snap it onto, oh, onto the little ring in the middle, then go up and then tie the knot on the side. I like this way because I can lengthen and shorten by using that eye. If I have to untie that knot each time, I have to make sure that it's shortened or lengthened or and the right amount of length. This is just, I can decide one time, two times or three times, do I wanna bend more? Okay, this is too much, I just loosen it once. It's very precise if you work with the top uh, ones. So this is just a full dressed horse for how I lunge them. The lunge line, that bridle with it, headpiece, um, the protection, the padding underneath the surcingle and the ropes, and then of course the whip. Now this is the goal. This is my last uh, picture. Um, this is where I'm going to end because this will be the start of the next webinar. And that's actually the actual training of the horse with all the material I just showed you guys. So this is just a chance for if you don't have anything yet, you can um, get it or even get something um, made or 
something that looks like this. It doesn't have to be exactly like this as long as it's easy to work with and um, it is comfortable for you to work with. So um, that is uh, what I use for my training. Any questions about these materials, this tag, Jason? No, no, I don't have anything right now. Okay. Um, about that hoof question. Yeah, let me pull it, pull it back up one moment here. Let's, uh, let me get a refresh here. Okay. So. Nope, it looks like Duca actually answered the question for me. So I appreciate Duca oh. doing that. So he's, he's on top of it, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> So he's not asleep yet. <laughs> okay, so uh, no, I've got uh, some comments here. Excellent presentation. Thank you for taking the time. I know it's uh, what, 2.18 in the morning there for you? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. So it's <laughs> so uh, it's, it's uh, almost morning time for you. So yeah, um, I don't have any other questions right now other than uh, those saying thank you and um, um, that's it. Any closing remarks before I make mine? Um, just, you know, the, the things I'm showing are factual or um, I'm not speaking that much English lately, so it's hard to find, harder to find my words at the moment. <laughs> um, it's just practical things that we actually use. I want to show you guys reality. Um, I can make a list and just, it has to look like this or this or this, but I wanna show um, that nothing is perfect. Um, we have to do with what we have as well. We have to um, figure out how to train a horse. Every horse is different. Uh, everybody uses a little bit different tech. Everybody has a different system. Um, I'm just trying to show you the basics, what we do um, to prepare them for occurring. And as you can see, what I just showed you is actually all the basics that each table here in the Netherlands has in their tech room and what they use. Uh, they use double, double long, uh, lines, so uh, long lines or just a lunging line. Um, they use the back piece, some of them drive them a little bit more, but the basics is all this. Um, poles, the leg protection, lunging, practicing in hand. So this is the, uh, just the, the heads up for what's coming. This is the material I use, uh, and that's what I'm going to be working with in the next uh, two or three webinars as well. So... And if anybody has any questions about this, that can come up next time as well. Well, Petra, I want to thank you uh, for taking the time out of your uh, your schedule. I know that our membership certainly does appreciate it. Um, again, we will uh, we have been recording this. Uh, we'll be on our YouTube station in the next uh, uh, day or two. Yes. On behalf of the Fenway Foundation for Frisian Horses, we would like to thank you for attending tonight's webinar. If you do have additional questions after watching this, uh, we would encourage you to please submit them to fauna at fauna.com and we will make sure that they get sent to Petra for a, for a response. Um, again, this webinar was recorded and we do look forward to our next session, which will be on April 22nd, uh, yes. 2021, another Thursday. And we'll be uh, continuing on with what you were presenting tonight on the physical conditioning of the horse. Is that correct? Yes, correct. Um, okay. I want to add one thing. The last webinar was uh, shaky um, about the clipping. Um, what I'm planning to do is I'm going to um, voice over it again and put it on uh, my own YouTube channel. So if one, people want to um, watch it for more details, then they should go there. Probably end of next week, it should be on there. And it's Terrific. just on, on Petra Zeilen. You can find me on YouTube. So, Okay. Well, we appreciate your time this evening. Now uh, we'll get some rest. Yes, thank you. 
okay. have to get my horses to the veterinarian clinic for uh, embryo transfer tomorrow morning. Oh, so exciting. that's what I'm going to do. Exciting. Okay, yes. well, we, we look forward to next month. Yes, thank you for having me. Thank you, Petra. Bye-bye.